Well, welcome everybody to our keynote hot talk of the season. It is so exciting to see so many people out here. Um, I just want to very quickly, before we get on to today's presentation, uh, remind everybody that we'll have our final hot talk in this season on April 13th in the same place. Pam Selfeld, our uh, Director of Global Engagement, is going to be giving a talk on um, Shakespeare. Um, Joshua Pollock is currently an adjunct professor of history at Modesto Junior College back in my home state of California. Uh, I guess I should say to everybody, my name is Paul Muncy. Uh, <laughs> thank you again for coming out. His, his primary interest, uh, areas of interest are uh, in the history of Northern Europe, Asia, and the Middle East with a particular focus on Abrahamic religions. Uh, he's done some world travel, he's, he's looked into, if anybody wants to bug him afterwards, he's done a lot of work with Nordic legends, um, having spent some time in Iceland and up, I think in Norway or Sweden, up in Sweden. Um, and also done a little bit of work down in Southeast Asia looking at the cultures in Thailand and Cambodia, uh, as well as Hong Kong, I think, for a little while. Uh, he comes from a family lineage that is fairly, very deeply rooted in religion. His, his great-grandmother's father, Reverend Charles Albert Parker, served congregations in Colorado, as well as in the Bay Area in California. His grandfather, Dwight Lang, was a lifelong member of Gideon's International, which if you've ever been to a hotel, I'm sure you have heard of Gideon's International. They, they, they supply Bibles to the world. Um, Let's see here. His uh, great uncle father, Leo Davis, was a Catholic priest and a founder of uh, the, the Cardin Center? Cardine. Cardine Center, uh, a Catholic social justice organization down in San Diego, California. And <coughs> Professor Pollock's parents converted to Jehovah's Witnesses religion, um, in which he served as a ministerial servant for a short duration. Pollock no longer is a member of the Jehovah's Witness community, uh, but during his time in college he delved very deep into understanding the history of Christianity's global legacy uh, and the religions of other civilizations. He is somewhat versed in the Hebrew language, in the Arabic language. He is going to be talking, as a matter of fact, you're probably going to hear some terms today to kind of connect together this part of the world. I think one of the things we often forget here in the West is that Christianity starts off as a Middle Eastern religion, just as Judaism, just as Islam. So he's going to be taking us through all of this, and I don't want to uh, belabor any more time, because he's going to try to keep it close to an hour and a half, so we'll have time for questions afterwards. And to be quite honest, um, he'll go all night if you want to just keep bugging him with questions till midnight. If we get to the Q&A session and, uh, and you really, really want to grill him, Feel free, but also don't feel obligated to stick around to midnight as somebody is trying to hold his feet to the fire, but he loves that type of stuff. We actually went to graduate school together, so this has been a real privilege for me to be able to bring out somebody who I have got to work with in the past. And so without any further ado, I'd like to introduce Professor Joshua Pollock. Well, can you guys hear me? Okay. Okay. So thank you, Paul. Uh, uh, He's been a great friend and, and colleague, and it's been nice to be able to have all these conversations that we've been able to have and to have them here with you all. Um, and I want to thank you all for coming. Um, it was, of course, supposed to be on a Thursday, and it's St. Patrick's Day. Um, and so um, it's, it's, uh, it's interesting because I was looking up St. Patrick, and um, in Ireland, the Islamic Center of Ireland just put out a uh, statement on their internet, uh, congrat like, like basically saying, um, it's wonderful to celebrate St. Patrick's Day, uh, uh, and congratulations to Irish people of this wonderful uh, man who came from another place, because St. Patrick wasn't Irish, he was British, and he came and preached uh, uh, you know, the word of God to the Irish, and um, he said this was a good thing. So this was an Islamic scholar basically you know, celebrating the idea of of uh, St. Patrick's Day, but of course without the beer, because if you guys know, Muslims don't drink alcohol, right? Okay. Um, so uh, in any case, um, what I want to do is, is um, let you all know exactly kind of the outline or, or, or what I have planned to go over. We have the presentation as the heirs of Abraham. We could have easily made the presentation uh, as uh, called the heirs of monotheism, because 
Uh, if you all know, right, monotheism means belief in one God, and that's what these three religions are mainly known for. It would surprise a lot of you, possibly, to know that there's many religions in the world, uh, maybe not many, but there's, there's other religions that also claim to be monotheistic, but do not have any historic connection to Judaism, Christianity, or Islam. So we start with Abraham. Uh, why Abraham? Why are they called Abrahamic religions? Because uh, all three religions believe in prophets, right? And a prophet, uh, by the way, um, I'm not sure how much everybody knows in terms of, of the religious background. So sometimes I'll, ex I'll explain, explain some things that maybe all of you know, and I might go over some things that some of you don't. But a prophet is going to get some communication with God that they can deliver a message to humanity. Rather, it's in a dream, d uh, inspiration, or directly communicating with God, right? And so these three religions believe that there have been a series of men that they put in their holy books that have been prophets. And what's interesting is that Judaism, Christianity, and Islam has a lot of these prophets that they all agree, they all will tell you, are, have, were uh, in communion with God. Um, so Abraham, for the Jews, is called our father Abraham. He's seen as uh, the progenitor of the Jewish people. Uh, Christianity and Muslims uh, and Islam also believe in Abraham. Moses is also very important. Um, King David is believed in all three religions. Jonah, if you know the story of Jonah and the big fish, right? Uh, okay. Um, Job is believed in by uh, uh, all of them. Elijah, I can go on and on. There's so many prophets. But obviously, if they have all of these prophets in common, they all believe that they're worshiping the God of Abraham. There's three different religions, not one. So they clearly have differences, right? Or else they would be one religion. Now, I'm going to do, uh, I'm, I'm going to start off by just mentioning some of the basic ideas of where, what it means to be Jewish, what it means to be Christian, and what it means to be Muslim. But while I do that, I'm going to do some compare and contrast of things that they're similar on but also have difference. Now, my intention is, you know, it's okay uh, to challenge maybe some preconceived ideas. No one should feel attacked. I'm trying to make this very descriptive. And what I mean by that is, I'm not describing what I think is true or, or, or making any snide, snarky remarks about anything. When I cover this, the idea is, is that this should be an accurate and, and, uh, um, presentation of how each religion uh, believes on certain things and where they differ. And when I talk about the difference, I'm not trying to stimulate communal strife. Uh, I'm not trying to highlight conflict. What I want us to do is understand how do, there's clearly a difference. And we do know from watching the news and we know any kind of history, the, the religions don't always get along, right? So what is the root of that? And, and then also, sometimes they do. So what is, where, where are they finding common ground? So that's what I'm hoping to do with that. And then after I do that, I'm going to transition into just covering the holy books, the basic holy books of the three religions. And the methodologies in which their religious scholars would, would, would do to actually uh, come up with a conclusion to define what is Jewish, what is Christian, and what is Muslim. Now, I'm also aware, the reason why I had uh, Paul also go over my family background is that I'm aware that when someone says they're a Christian, there's many different interpretations of what that means, right? Okay? And when my mom and dad converted Jehovah's Witness, my grandfather wasn't happy about it. <laughs> right? right? And, and so in other words, uh, um, there's a lot of differences even there. So in this hour and a half, I'm trying to give us the most basic ideas. I'm going to skip over a lot of history. I'm hoping to at least ground us in some very clear things so that if you're interested in d delving deeper, you have a better foundation to look at that, okay? And so um, that's, that's, that's the kind of outline of what I have for there. Real quick, just to get a feel, read for the room, how many of you here feel like you have at least some knowledge of at least one of the religions we're going to talk about tonight? Can I see a show of hands? OK, that's great. All right, well, you guys may know the whole thing. <laughs> um, OK, 
So uh, I am going to start here. We're going to start with uh, Abraham. And uh, of course, this is just, you know, we could put any picture of an older patriarch, right? A, a, the special prophet. When, uh, I'm, I'm not going to focus a lot on dates. For one, the dates get messy. There's traditional views of, uh, of, of when uh, these characters exist. For historians and archaeologists, okay, a lot of what I'm going to tell you is not easy to find in the archaeological record. And that's why sometimes you have historians, they seem like they're trying to attack the Bible. Uh, that's, I'm not even going to focus on that material. The issue is, is, is not that. It's just sometimes you're looking for evidence. Do we have a story of Abraham, let's say? Okay, let's give me an example. Right now, we have a president, whether you like him or love him or not. We can hear people talking about him in Japan. You guys get what I'm saying? Okay. So sometimes when you go back in history and you go very far, you don't have necessarily a lot of outside sources other than the sources you're working with that tell you that they existed. So I'm going to go from the presupposition of these stories, just, just tell the stories, just letting you know um, the story itself is supposed to be taking place a very long time ago. Okay, right? Uh, over 1,800 years before Jesus, okay? Um, in any case, let's start with the Jewish religion. The Jewish religion is a little harder to, uh, takes up a little bit more time because there's so much time that the Jewish religion has developed. We're talking about a people that go back to the Middle East, and, the, and you will hear three different uh, definitions, right? You've heard Hebrews. Everybody heard this term, Hebrews. You've heard Israel or Israelite. And then you hear Jews. They're basically the same people. It gets a little bit complicated if we talk about Samaritans, but I'm not going to go into that. For the most part, just know that when I, 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 it's interchangeable. If I say Hebrew, Israel, or, and, and Israel as a people, um, not even necessarily a country, but just like the people of Israel and uh, Jews, OK? So the Jewish story uh, is that uh, there was Abraham. He's the father of the Jewish people. And he's located originally in an area that would be modern Iraq. So if we are Christian or Jewish, this patriarch or founder starts us in Iraq. Okay, Now, he is going to move around, and he's going to be given a promise by God that his descendants will be blessed and that there will be a promised land for them in this land of Canaan, which I will have maps and we'll talk a little bit more about later. But along the way, uh, his descendants end up as slaves in Egypt, right? So the story goes. And God is a let that happen. And so this is where our other prophets come in. Moses and Aaron come. God brings some prophets to go to Pharaoh of Egypt and to tell him, you've got to let my people go. I have a plan for them. And of course, what does Pharaoh do? He says no. So then uh, using Moses and Aaron, God sets all these plagues upon Pharaoh in the story. And the Egyptians have a very hard time. And he's very stubborn. And it's only at the end that Pharaoh finally says, OK, fine. Let, uh, I'm, uh, uh, you guys get out of here. So Moses and Aaron lead God's people from slavery out of Egypt. Pharaoh changes his mind. He's got ego. He's upset. He gets his army to come back and follow them. And they're leaving, and there's the Red Sea, right? What are we, what's going to happen? So, you know, God has a miracle. Moses and God's people cross the Red Sea. And as Pharaoh and his soldiers come behind raging, the Red Sea falls on them, and they all die. God's people are liberated, and they're with Moses and Aaron now in the, in, in, in the desert. And they're going to go on their way up into Canaan, Canaan, up in the north. Okay. There's a lot of things that happen in this story, but the important part is, is they come to Mount Sinai. And Moses goes up into the top, and God speaks to him, and there is going to be holy laws, which are going to be a part of the Christian Bible as well. And there's going to be a covenant. And the covenant is going to be that God makes a pact with the Jewish people 
that if they accept this contract, like a marriage contract, they're going to get blessings if they fulfill the things that they, are, uh, they say that they're going to fulfill. And if they don't follow those things, it's not going to go well for them. It's going to be the blessings and the malediction. And they agree to this covenant. So God is supposed to be the God of the universe. He's the God of all of us, regardless of your religion. But this is going to be a covenant with a special set of laws that only applies to the Jewish people. Now, just to briefly kind of explain how this works, in Judaism, if we backed up to another Bible story before uh, uh, you know, Moses, there was Noah and the ark and the flood, right? By the way, the Muslims believe in this as well, okay? And um, when the flood is over, God uh, gets Noah and uh, uh, his righteous children who survived the flood because God was mad at the world, right? Because humans are, were not doing good things. He tells Noah seven laws. Those are called Noahide laws. And so for Judaism, all human beings have to follow the seven laws that were given to, Mo, to, uh, sorry, to Noah. And you're going to have the potential to be blessed by God. If you are born Jewish, you have to follow 613 laws instead of seven, okay? And that is the covenant that you have, okay? Um, and the question and answer portion, if you have any more questions on that, you can ask more, but I'll, I'll just move on to say, so we get to this covenant, they have this, this law, and Moses is not gonna be able to make it. Joshua is going to lead God's people into the land of Canaan. Now, this is in the land of promise. Now, this is actually probably the most controversial part of the story. And, <clears throat> and I've just got to, but I got to bring it up because it's going to have some other future political implications. What are God's people supposed to do to the Canaanites that are there? Right? If you know the story, they have to kill everyone, including the children. That is, that, and that's what it means. And it's in the Bible. It's very clear. Um, and rabbis have tackled with this, uh, Christian theologians tackled with this. Thomas Paine, who wrote Common Sense, he actually wrote a book called The Age of Reason where he said why he doesn't believe in God because of this, these passages. These are some of them. Now, I'm not promoting this. I'm just simply saying this, this happened. But why I'm bringing it up? Because it's going to have some future problematic implications with the Israel-Palestine conflict later on. And I'll talk about it just a little bit, okay? But... It's fair to say that for Jews and Christians, the idea is that God is always right and that the biblical stories, you know, we, we, we tackle them as they are, right? And the bottom line is, is that the Jewish people are going to replace the Canaanites. And, it's, and that area is going to be called Israel. It's going to be called Judea and Samaria. And sometime later, it's going to be called Palestine. But that's something I'll talk about later. And so... I want to take this section uh, uh, here and move us right into the first century. You have the majority of Jews that live in, a certain, in, in, in that area. They have a temple in Jerusalem. It's dedicated to God with animal sacrifices. They also have to deal with political players, big political powers that are always in their space. Greece is going to come in and dominate them. That's why, by the way, Christians have a New Testament it's written in Greek. Why? Alexander the Great. <laughs> okay? So the Greeks are going to come in. The Romans are going to come in. Jewish people are going to be dealing with all of these uh, entities that are controlling them. And even if they have their own ruler, they're going to be like puppet kings. So they have this idea of a Mashiach. Okay? A Mashiach. Actually, you got to get water for that one, right? Okay? <laughs> so in Hebrew... Mashiach means anointed one, okay? The actual ritual of being anointed. It's where we get the English word Messiah from, okay? The Mashiach. In Greek, the word for this is Christos. This is where we get the word Christ from. So if you believe in, um, uh, you know, I mean, so in other words, Christ, Christian, Messiah, Mashiach, these are all the same thing, 
Everybody follow that, okay? Okay. And so another way you could call a Christian is a messianic, all right? A person who believes in uh, uh, the idea of the Messiah. And this idea of a Messiah for Jewish people is that there would be a messianic era. It would liberate the Jewish people militarily, uh, and it would also create something that would be good for the entire world. Now, here's where we get to our little issues with our different interpretations of things. We know that the majority of Jewish people never accepted the person that the Christians believed was the one who fulfilled this. Christians believe that Jesus, also in Hebrew would be known as Yeshua, that this man is the one who fulfilled that role, right? Okay? The majority of Jewish people have never accepted that. Why? How, how do we get to this major um, misunderstanding? The Jewish people, the, the Jewish theologians have argued, look, we have had this tradition and we still have it, that the Mashiach is a warring, not warring, but he is a mighty liberator, okay? Better than George Washington, right? Okay, okay? Somebody who's really going to, uh, 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 you know, kick out whatever foreigners are bothering us and set things up, okay? And your Messiah died on a cross. You're, you're wearing it. You're wearing some, that's, a, that's, that's failure, okay? Right? Now, that kind of hurts, right? For Christians, it's like, whoa, this is, but, okay, but we need to understand where is the divide, where, where are they not seeing the same thing? Okay, and so the Christians have then said, well, look, our writings show that your leaders rejected him and prodded the Romans into convincing the Romans that he was being subversive. And when he got nailed on the cross, that's something that happened that you, that this is what your leaders did. But the Christians are going to say another response. They're going to say, this was not failure. This is the most powerful, conquering thing that any human being has ever done because he died for our sins. And so Christians are going to say of every, of every kind, right, that, look, when Adam was born, the first parent of all humans, and all three religions believe in this also, that Adam and his wife Eve sinned against God. Sin comes into the world. The Christians are going to say, Jesus was the second Adam. He's the balancing act of the sin that was taken place that our humans have, have, have had. And that the reason why there's the temple in Jerusalem with the animal sacrifices that, that have been taking place in the Bible, which most Christians are aware of this story as well, this is happening because of, of sin. And Jesus, when he dies on the cross, nullifies that sin. I mean, you can be redeemed through understanding the blood of Jesus Christ. And he gets resurrected into heaven. And everybody who acknowledges that Jesus Christ died for us on the cross is going to be saved. This is not a failure. So this is a Christian. Uh, and then the Christians are going to say another thing. They're going to say, here's one more thing. He's not just the Messiah. He's God's son. And actually, God the Father, God's son is also God. So now, now for Jews, this is like, wait a minute. This is way off the grid, okay, okay, right? Now, we know uh, that uh, Christians claim to be monotheists. There's nobody ever debates that. But what Christianity brings into the story that's different than the Muslims and it's different than the Jews, uh, in the Shema, in Deuteronomy 6.4, it says, Shema Yisrael Adonai Eloheinu Adonai Echad. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is Echad, one. And so the Jews are going to say, this sounds like you're making God broke up into three pieces or two pieces. What's going on? So Christians are going to say, now, Christians, and we're going to learn about this a little bit later, have had conflict over the exact nature of Jesus. In other words, okay, so part of the reasons my grandfather was upset with my parents being Jehovah's Witness is Jehovah's Witness believed that Jesus is only God's son and not God the son. Right? So this is going to be something that happens in Christian history. Um, but ultimately, Christians are saying that uh, uh, the majority consensus believes that, that there's three aspects of God. God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Ghost. These are three aspects of one God. And that God 
emptied himself into human flesh and died for everybody. So that makes Jesus the Messiah extra special. Everybody understand what I'm saying, right? Okay. For Jewish interpretation of Messiah, everything that a Christian values about Jesus is completely not what the traditional Jewish view of Messiah is. And that's one of the, the, the kind of bones of contention or, or, or where it was a little bit lost and confused. The other side of it uh, um, is this idea of sin, of humans being infested with sin. Okay? And we're going to talk more about that a little bit later. Now, so this is what the, the Christians believe. In the early first centuries, from a historical point of view, I got to tell you, it's very difficult to pinpoint the exact history of Christian in the first early centuries. Okay? If you just read the scriptures that you have in your Bible, you can go with that. You have church traditions of the Roman Catholic Church. You can go with that. But if you want to talk about finding outside sources to really try to figure out, it's a little tricky. What we do know is if we fast forward over 300 years later, Christianity is going to be, go from being a somewhat obscure uh, sect of Christianity, or that's how a lot of people would have viewed it, right? Um, to literally being legalized by Constantine, a Roman emperor, who is eventually going to convert. And the, and, and the Roman institution, the Roman government is going to not just legalize Christianity, but start really supporting, funding it. Christianity is going to go from being just a small group of Jews who are believing that Jesus is the Messiah, being, and that, that being rejected by the majority of the Jews, to literally being attached to one of the world's largest empires. And it's going to have a full kind of political structure, right? Okay? And then eventually, a lot of people think that um, Constantine made it the official religion. He didn't. He just legalized it. Several decades later, it would be Theodosius who makes it the only religion. Now, what's interesting, Christianity is going to ban paganism. They're going to literally kill off uh, 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 the worshipers of Odin and Thor. They're going to, uh, uh, the, the Serapis cults that were in Egypt, anything like that will be wiped out. There's one religion that will be allowed to survive, but in a humiliated state and be on blast all the time. It's the Jewish religion, okay? And there's a long set of the theological ideas I could talk about that, but for now, we're just going to have to leave it at that, okay? Now, if we fast forward another 300 years in the future, around 610, okay? 610 years after Jesus. In Arabia, in the Hejaz, in an area that is now Saudi Arabia, there's a man named Muhammad, who gets a visitation while he's in a cave from an angel. And the angel's name is Gabriel. This is the same angel that is in the Jewish scriptures. And in Christianity, uh, is Gabriel important? And Gabriel goes to Mary, right? And says, you're going to have the Messiah. And guess what? For Muslims, when... Muhammad gets this revelation. He, he believes that he's getting messages from this angel in the name of the God of Abraham, the same God of the Jews and the Christians. So, okay, and what about Mary and Jesus? Guess what? The Muslims actually say, and actually Muhammad would have said, through his understanding of God, because this is supposed to come from God, not Muhammad, the Christians were right. Jesus was the Messiah. They get their revelation in Arabic. They believe the Arabic is uh, a holy language from heaven. So the, the Quran, which I will talk about, their holy book, means recitation. And in the Quran, in Arabic, it says that Jesus is Isa al Messiah, Jesus the Messiah. He's actually called that. There's actually a book in their holy book called Surat Maryam, the Book of Mary. Named the only woman that given a name in the Islamic holy book is Mary, Jesus' mother. Okay? And in the account of the book of Mary, God's spirit, the Ruh, the Ruh, the Ruh Allah, the spirit of God, is what makes her pregnant. She has the immaculate uh, virgin birth. 
just like Christians, okay? So if Muslims believe in this, what's the difference between Muslims and Christians? Okay, here's where, here's where the difference happens. So in the same revelations that we're talking about, what happens is, is that Muhammad learns that when Jesus is coming on the cro to be crucified, and it's the same story. He came to Israel. They rejected him. They prodded on to the Romans. He's being sent by the Romans to get crucified. But you know what? God does not let any of his prophets get killed in this way. So according to the Quran, the Muslim text, God miraculously takes Jesus up and replaces another body. And it looks like Jesus is on the cross, but Jesus doesn't die on the cross. Now, all the Christians, I see some of the faces, wait a minute, right? Okay, right? Because in Christianity, this is the most fundamentally important aspect of what Jesus, we just talked about how this is like the most important thing for Christianity. Jesus dies for our sins, and then the Muslims just take that away, right? Right? Okay? And so that's, the, that, that's a major, major uh, 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 kind of shocker, right? Okay? But it even goes deeper than this, okay? The Muslims say, yes, Jesus is the Nibi Allah. He's, he's, he's a prophet. He's Ibn Maryam. He's a son of Mary. He's Al-Masih. He's the Messiah. He's even Kalamat Allah, the word of God. But wait a minute. God's son? In the Quran, it says, Lam yalid wa lam yulad. He, referring to God, did not beget nor was begotten. Okay? Can't have a son. It even gets it goes further. It says in the Quran, La taqulu thalatha. Say not Trinity. God is one. Okay. Now, we're, okay, so, so it's like, we just said, what is so fundamental about the Messiah for Christianity? Jesus dies for our sins. He's our Lord and Savior. He's God's son and also God, if you believe in the Trinity. And the Muslims cut that out. And in fact, they kind of talk about the oneness of God that the Jews and Muslims are actually going to agree upon. So, so, so when I talked about comparing and contrasting, to this day, the Jewish conception of God and the, and the Muslim conception of God are going to be a, a, a little more similar based on the strict, what they view monotheism and not relating to the Trinity concept. So that's just some of the difference there. Now, Muhammad also said that he is the seal of the prophets. So uh, the revelation of, for his understanding is that Jesus prophesied the coming of Muhammad and that what he does is he, is he gets revelations from God to clean up the mess that the Jews and the Christians have kind of got wrong. So in, in Islamic doctrine, Jews and Christians are called Ahl al-Kitab, people of the book. And the understanding is, is that there was nur, spiritual light in the Torah, in the Torah, the Zabur, the Psalms, and the Injil, the Gospel. But the problem is, is that according to Islamic doctrine, Jews, of course, were wrong to reject Jesus as the Messiah. And in their view, Christians distorted the, who Jesus was. And so that's something that needs to be fixed. And the pagans, the people who worship idols or polytheists, they're, that's completely rejected. So in Islam, those who are, are, are idolaters and uh, uh, pagans, they're kind of viewed the same way that Jews and Christians viewed those, those kind of things, okay? And there, so, so Islam is going to say Jews and Christians almost had things right, and they could, still, they could still be fully right. They just got to see where we cleaned it up and recognize the prophethood of Muhammad. Now, both the, those two religions don't do that, or else they're Muslim, right? Okay? So that's where we get the three. Was this clear uh, enough on this part so far? Okay, now, it's not just that they have disagreements about who Jesus is. And I thought it would be fun to talk about some ideas that they have that would look like they would be similar but are very different. And I thought it would be, f um, yeah, fun, I will say it. I thought it would be fun to talk about Satan the devil. Okay, now... For anybody raised Christian, 
If I right now put a pentagram picture up here, half the people here would want to throw something at me or get out. It's like, don't do that. That's, it's, it gets chills, right? OK? Many of you are going to be shocked. But in Judaism, Satan is not bad. He's actually an angel of God. He's on God's team. How does this happen? And how did we get to, what is going on? Uh, yeah, yeah, right, okay. Now, there's two traditional interpretations of, of, of Satan and Judaism that I think is interesting to go over. Okay, the first time that Satan is brought up, the word Satan in the Bible, and this is the Bible that Christians also believe in, is in Numbers 22.22. And the Hebrew word is Satan. And God tells one of his angels, there, there's, a, there's a prophet named Balaam, and he's going to put a curse on Israel. He's going to do something that's bad. You might have also, if you had any Sunday school education, there was Balaam and the donkey and the angel in the road with the, okay, right, if you know the story. All right. And God tells the angel, go be a Satan to Balaam, to be an obstacle. That's how the word is used. So being Satan is positive just right there in that sense, meaning just as be an obstacle. Now, let's talk about the book of Job. How many here have read the book of Job or know about the book of Job? Can I see a, book, a show of hands? Okay, so a good amount, but I'll explain it. So in the book of Job, there is a man called Job who's really holy, and it starts off with gods in heaven, and then there's the Bene Ha Elohim. There is the sons of God, which are the angels. And in this heavenly court, Satan just walks in. He's, he's hanging out. Now, I have to say, growing up Christian, I used to read this, and I was always thinking, this is kind of a strange passage because it's, there's supposed to be a cosmic battle. Satan's the bad guy. And he's just hanging out with the angels and God up in the heavenly court, right? Okay? And... And then uh, Satan and God have this very relaxed conversation. He's like, so God's like, you see my servant Job? Uh, uh, and he's like, yeah. And he's like, well, what do you want to do with him? And, and Satan's like, well, I got to tell you, he's only worshiping you because he's blessed with all of these great things. And if you just let me mess up his life a little bit, I bet you he wouldn't stay loyal to you. So God says, go ahead. Have at it, but you can't kill him. You can do anything else to him, right? Now, when I grew up reading this, and I'm sure like all of you still, no matter where we're at in belief, it's, it does, it's like you're wondering, okay, what to make of this? For the rabbis, this is, it's very clear. Satan is a part of the angel, the body of angels, but what is he doing? How is this, why is this happening? Okay, here's why. In Judaism, every one of us as human beings are going to have the opportunity, we're going to be born in, we're going to live out two inclinations. God makes human beings with free will. And we have a yitzar hatov, a good inclination, and we have a yitzar hara, a bad inclination, an evil inclination. Although translating it as evil is a little bit complex because it could also be looked at as your animal instincts. Having the drive for food and sex uh, is not always going to be considered bad. It has to have a context. So the yitzar hara is like your most... Your, your, your basis instincts, and you're, you're supposed to have the Yitzar HaTov, you know, your good inclination that you, with your free will to, to kind of, you know, like in the cartoons when you were a kid, there was like the angel and the devil on one side, and you're trying to make a choice. You remember those old cartoons like that? It's like the same kind of concept, right? And so Satan's role given by God is to challenge us, right? In other words, God says, I give you all free wills. And it's not a focus on sin like Christianity. The idea is, is that it's good to be a human. And, you know, one rabbi said, and this is as shocking as a, as a Christian, he said, thank God for Satan. And he said this because what he said is, is that Satan gives you as an individual the opportunity to prove that you're going to follow your Yitzhah HaTov. You're going to be, you're going to make the right decision. Okay? Like, so, uh, now, it makes sense, though, the humans are not necessarily really going to like Satan, right? Because even if it's God's angel, do you want to get yourself in trouble? Do you want to have temptation thrown at you? Do you want to have a, 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 the temptation to do the wrong thing? So, you know, he is kind of lurking. And it's easy to see how he can be viewed as a bad character, even in Jewish texts, if you're not understanding the, the concept, because Satan is creating mischief for, for humans. 
Now, there's another interpretation that's in the, the Jewish writings that Satan might actually be the Yitzhar Hara itself. And, and, and the story of Satan is a metaphor for our evil inclination. When you, if, if you're married and you are doing an act of disloyalty to your partner, and that's God's rule, you Satanized yourself. In other words, you know the, the rules, and you got tempted, and you let that instinct trip you up, right? So, so no matter how the in interpretation goes, Satan isn't in opposition to God. He is a, merely a, 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 a tester to humanity. Now, this is very different from Christianity, right? If you know the scripture in the Christian New Testament, in 2 Corinthians 4.4, 4, it calls Satan the god of this age. The god of this age blinds the minds of unbelievers so they cannot see the glories of Jesus Christ. Now, giving Satan a term like the god, again, this is where Muslims and Jews both get together and they're like, wait a minute, what's going on over here? With the, like this, this is, this is a, 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 that's too much power for Satan. The idea of he's being the dragon and having cosmic war with Michael and his archangels, right? Okay. This is very foreign to a Muslim concept and a Christian concept. So what about Muslims? Muslims are kind of in between. Now, in Islam, uh, they have a, a verse that says, A'udhu birab al-falak min sharima khalaq. I take refuge in the Lord of the dawn from the evil that which he created. God creates evil? What are the Muslims saying? Guess what? Isaiah 45, 7, and, and the Jewish prophets that Jews and Christians believe in. God says, O say shalom, u vore ra. I make peace and I create evil. That's what God says. Now, some translations in the, in the Bible say calamity. It's almost like the translator doesn't want to say evil. Like, like you know what I mean? Like, it's like, I mean, because it's not like really wrong. I mean, calamity is evil, but it just, it feels weird, right? Now, Judaism and uh, uh, Islam, when they're saying that, though, they'll tell you, no, we don't want to attribute evil to God. That would be something we wouldn't want to do. What they're saying is, is that there is no opposition to God. God is fully empowered all time. There's no cosmic war even close with God. So then who's Satan in, in Islam? They actually do believe, though, he is a reject angel from God, more like Christians. He's also called Iblis. And so in the story, in, for the Muslims, is that when Adam is created, the first human, God tells uh, uh, Satan, I want you to do an act of obeisance before my creation. All the angels must bow down before humans because we're awesome. <laughs> okay, right? And Satan... He's got an ego. He's, he's like, I will worship God, you, God. But you're making somebody like lower than us and we have to bow before that? There's no way. I'm not doing it. Now, the idea of being a Muslim is that you submit to God. You follow God's will. Iblis, or Satan, he rejects God and God rejects him. And then, you know, obviously he's now upset, of course, at us. <laughs> right, right, right. You know, it's, it's us that got him upset. And so Satan isn't going to be a powerful entity that God's doing battle with but he's going to be like a nuisance to us, like, like a really bad mosquito, uh, okay? Like, he's going to always try to trip us up. Uh, and, you know, we don't have to, in, in, in Islam, you are also always worried about Satan, but again, he's really more or less a trickster. You know, a Muslim told me once, it'd be like this. Muslims are not supposed to drink alcohol. They're not supposed to have premarital sex, all sorts of things. And let's say a young Muslim wants to go to a club, go dancing, lots of liquor, lots of love, right? Okay. And he said, Satan is going to try to get you to do all the things that we Muslims are not supposed to do. But he's just, maybe he's making it more appealing, but ultimately you are responsible for your actions. So in a sense, it's kind of like the Jews, where it's like, he's kind of playing that role. It's like, you know better, and Satan's coming in, and he's going to try to make the bad look a lot better. But ultimately, you're going to do the right thing or you're not, right? And so that's how it's going to be viewed. So that's uh, uh, um, you know, one example. And so here's the irony. In America, we have a religion called Satanism. And there's different branches of it. The concept of a scary devil Satan, this powerful dark lord, 
is uniquely Christian in terms of the context that it's responding to. The Islamic world and the Jewish world would not have an equivalent to that kind of Satanism. Uh, does that make sense to you guys you know what I'm saying? On that context, okay? So that's one, uh, you know, just example of where, uh, you know, that I was thinking that you'd find all interesting about their religion. One more, life after death. In Judaism, they do have what's called the olam haba. And, you ha and that's important. That means the, the world that which is to come. But it's a very marginal part of the discourse of being Jewish. The importance of being Jewish is the olam haze, the world that is now, this world. Think about it. Even the concept of the Mashiach, the Messiah, and the Messianic age, it happens on Earth. It's something that changes Earth and makes it better. And they're not, they don't believe that humans are riddled with sin. And so it's just a minor part of the discussion. It's not the main emphasis. In Christianity, is that the way that Christians look at it? No, right? Because we have the understanding, if we grow up Christian, you're born into Adamic sin. We're infested with sin like cancer that you can't get rid of. And the real hope is the rapture, is the future, is to go in heaven, right? Am I right? right? That, that's the main thing you look for. And so the last day, the second coming of Jesus, the rapture, uh, going into heaven, the earth will even be destroyed, and you don't want to be bad. They all go to hell, right? And so there's this emphasis on the real life is the, is the next life. So that's different. Now, Islam is much more similar to Christians on this. There is a prayer that Muslims pray five times a day, and they always talk about Yawmuddin, the day of judgment. So they're looking, too, for the, the end of the world. They talk about Jannah. Jannah is paradise, which is like heaven. In the Quran, their holy book, there's a lot of discussion about how great it would be to go to heaven, and you definitely don't want to be on the wrong side and go to Jahannam, which is hell. Okay? And so, but the difference I would say is that um, Muslims actually, because they, they're like Jews, they don't think that humans are inherently sinful. They don't think there needs to be a ransom sacrifice. So, the only difference is, is that Muslims, like Jews, are much more comfortable with the body, with the biology, right? God gives you pleasures on earth, and what's permissible you can enjoy. And I'm not saying that all Christians don't do that, but if you really look at the, 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 the fundamentals of Christian theology, the idea that we are sinners and need to acknowledge the blood of Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior is so fundamental. And I guess what I'm saying is that in Islam and Judaism, that is not how they conceptualize humanity. Does that make sense? Okay. So those are just two uh, major differences, I thought, that I would cover. So now that I, I covered those things, what I wanted to do was show uh, a background on the scriptures and how they developed uh, the theology for each religion. So believe it or not, we're moving on from this uh, PowerPoint. Okay. So I'm just going to briefly do this. Again, I told you I'm not going to do a lot of dates. Um, we're going to start with the first century because that's a great place to start with talking about uh, the Jewish religion, and it's a great place to talk about Christianity uh, in just a, a little bit. So um, we have in the first century, and this is, these are talked, two of these uh, groups are talked about in the Christian uh, scriptures, the Pharisees and the Sadducees. At this time, the majority in the population of this area are Jewish people, and there's different religious sects, different ways of understanding Judaism. The Sadducees are attached to the temple in Jerusalem. So the Sadducees revolve around this area, the, the sacrifice, the temples that's set up in the Bible. But the Sadducees, and this is acknowledged in the Christian scriptures, don't believe in life after death. Remember, I was telling you, Judaism already marginalizes that. The Sadducees don't believe in the resurrection or anything. Okay, oddly enough, right? The Pharisees are, are, have a lot of debates with Jesus. The Pharisees are, these are the ones that are going to become the rabbis. These are the, these are, this is the Jewish group that's going to, to be around with us throughout human history. Okay? Um, and I'll talk a little bit more about that in a second. Now, at the time, there was a lot of political drama. And I said there wouldn't be a lot of uh, uh, history in here uh, with a lot of dates, but this is important to mention. 
the Jewish religion is going to get a very cosmic event in the year 70 CE. At the time, the Romans were dominating their space, and you had zealots, they were called. Nowadays, we'd call them rabid nationalists, right? If we were occupied by Canada, we'd be burning maple leaf flags like crazy, right? Right? You know, you, right? I mean, for real, though, right? OK, right? This is, and, and think about if your fellow American that collaborates with the Canadians with that maple leaf thing. Oh, forget it. That guy's even worse, right? The Jewish people were going through a similar set of drama. Okay, where there were some Jewish people collaborating with the Roman Empire. There were some Jewish people having arguments about uh, the, the religion itself. And then there's the rebellion going on. And the Romans do not accept rebellions. Okay? Not just because they're Jewish, just you don't rebel against Rome. And so Rome goes in and they bring in the full might of their military. And that special temple that's mentioned in the Bible, that there's sacrifices to the God of Israel, gets smashed. Now, Jewish people to this day, there's, if you have a wedding, uh, you, have a, 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 you, you smash the glass uh, cup. Why? Because even on a day that's as wonderful as a wedding, you can't forget the destruction of the temple. It's very important. Now, on top of this, the Sadducees are obviously going to not be able to function. Their whole point of their role is to f be the priest's of this temple that no longer exists now, right? So, and, and on top of that, the Jews are gonna have a lot of oral traditions that are gonna be in a precarious place uh, uh, to stick around. So, but it even gets worse, just for a second. A lot of people know about that 70 CE uh, drama. But in 132 to 136, there's what's called the Bar Kokhba revolt. And this is a man who claimed to be the Messiah. He was that warrior messiah that Jews claimed that they were looking for. He actually had control of the area for around two years. Coins were minted in the name of the Bar Kokhba revolt. This is where Rome finally just is like, you know what? I am not, this is, this is too much. And uh, uh, Rome is really going to come in and crack down. And the area is eventually going to be called Palestine after this uh, 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 section here, OK? Um, and so uh, that's just something to uh, keep in mind. I think what I'm going to do is this. So we have the temple being destroyed. We have uh, another revolt going on. And there is, the Jewish world is in upheaval. So keep that in mind as I move forward. But now I'm going to just start with the base, the base of Jewish scripture. And again, forgive me for bouncing around a lot. We do have a time constraint, and i got to go through several things. This is, the, the, it's called the Tanakh. This is the foundation of the Jewish uh, Bible. It's called the Hebrew Bible, the Hebrew Scriptures. There's a little bit of Aramaic in there, which is kind of like the difference of Spanish to Portuguese. Sometimes it's called the Hebrew Aramaic Scriptures. It's not the same as Arabic. I'll give you an example. Spirit in Aramaic is Rucha. Hebrew, it's Ruach. Arabic, it's Roch. Okay? They're all related languages, but Aramaic and Hebrew is closest, okay? Anyways, this is the Old Testament that Christians believe in. And if you're a Protestant Christian, you have the same books, not Catholic. I'm going to talk about that when we get to Christianity in a second. But if, you, but if you're Catholic, you have mostly the same books in your Old Testament, uh, but it's in a different order. And uh, so this is the foundation. Now, most people who study they have the idea that this is Judaism, is the Old Testament. Okay, that is the foundation, but this, this is where Judaism is at, the Talmud. What is this? Okay, how many have heard of the Talmud? Oh, that's a good amount. A little lot less than the other one. Okay, right? The Talmud, what is this story here? There is this belief that when Moses was on that mountain, Mount Sinai, everybody remember that? And there was that covenant given. Moses was given two Torahs, one that's written in the Tanakh that we just, I just was showing you. That's the first part of the Old Testament. And then he gave him an oral Torah, one word of mouth, that Moses passed to Joshua, Joshua to the elders, the elders to the prophets, the prophets to the great assembly. There was this line uh, went down, down, okay? And this, uh, then there was these commentators, these very holy men in this time period that 
made these legal decisions and, and debates, and it gets closed around this time in 500 CE. And you take the Mishnah, which is the oral Torah the, the, uh, of Moses, and you take the Gemara, and you put it together, and that's the Talmud. That might be a lot of information you're not going to remember, but let's just remember this. What is the Talmud? What does it do? In the Torah, from the Old Testament, the book that Christians have, there's this very odd verse, and I'm going to say odd respectfully. It says, don't boil a baby goat in its mother's milk. Anybody was tempted to do that? Don't do it. Okay, okay, right? All right. It's a passage. What do you do with that? Well, in the Talmud, it's clear. God has things separate. Okay, so for whatever reason, you don't mix cheese and meat products. I went to an Orthodox Jewish woman's home. She had two refrigerators in her kitchen, one for only uh, milk products, one for only meat. There's no cheeseburger in Judaism, okay? Okay, right? All right? Um, um, so, um, so what I'm trying to just say, when it comes to understanding Jewish religion and thought, even though Christians are, we have the understanding, if you grow up Christian, that the Old Testament is the Jewish scriptures, but, but Judaism is the Talmud. It's this, this is where much of the, of, of, the, of the practice of a religious Jew... Now, by the way, please, I need to say this too. I have so many Jewish friends that don't follow most of the laws. That's not... Okay, right? And there's different levels of following. So sometimes we make the trap. If you don't have friends in other faiths and you just read the textbook case, you think all of your friends are like just sitting around all day thinking about all this stuff, right? It's not how that works, okay? So, but if you're, if you're a, a, an Orthodox, or they're called Haredi, uh, really devout, yeah, you're going to follow all this stuff to the letter, okay? So um, just, just thought I would point that out. Okay, so this is important to know. I just thought I would mention a little difference about how they tackle the scripture because it's so different than what a, a, a Christian or a, a Muslim would approach this. So there is this famous debate in the Talmud, and if you get any Talmudic ed education, you're going to know about this. So this is not an obscure story. It's called the Oven of Achnai. And it's a story about this oven. Is it pure or impure? And the rabbis are having a debate about it. Now, it's understood by uh, the, the rabbis that the oven is not what's that important. For the, it's used as a prop for a discussion. There's a majority that say one opinion about the oven, and then there's one rabbi who stands against the rest of the rabbis. And so Rabbi Eliezer, that renegade rabbi, he says, if I'm right, may the trees bend. And he gets all these miracles he starts doing. And the rabbis say, that's not how you win a debate. You don't, you don't, you don't oh, you bend a tree. OK, great. Like, you didn't win your debate, right? OK, that's not how it works. So then Rabbi Eliezer, he does something that you know, it seems like it should be a sure win. He says, God, am I right? Let's see what God has to say about this. God comes into the equation and says, Rabbi Eliezer is right about everything, everything. And then the, the rabbi representing the majority, what does he say? God, the Torah is not in heaven. Wait, what's going on? Right? This rabbi debates with God. How does God think about this? A Muslim would never do this. Most Christians wouldn't do this. But why are they doing this? It's just it's very different. So one of the rabbis in the story, he gets a visitation from Elijah the prophet. that's hanging out in heaven. He comes down, and the rabbi says, God. No, he says, to, he says to Elijah, what does God think about what just happened? And Elijah says, God smiled and said, my children have tricked me. My children have tricked me. Now, what is going on here? I'll give you the quick paraphrase. The moral of the story is that According to this rabbinic tradition, God made the Torah to be debated by the, the rabbis on earth. And the consensus view of the rabbis are going to be what God's will is. That's the understanding. And it's an open document. They're going to have flexibility, you know, uh, uh, of whatever happens in modern times, or whatever, to do this. And so when God came in to intervene and say, Rabbi Eliezer is right. The rabbi was basically saying, God, that's not how you set this up. You set this up that we're the majority here on earth and do this. That's why I said, they quoted Deuteronomy. The, the, the Torah is not in heaven. And God agreed and said, good point. <laughs> Very different, right? Very different. That's all I'm going to say about that, right? Okay? I just thought you'd find that interesting. Now, 
one last text that you need to know to get the understanding of the basic ideas of everything uh, uh, in Judaism, the, the Midrash. Now, you see there's volumes. By the way, the Talmud is also volumes, OK? These are like encyclopedia sets. Not just, the Talmud's not like one little book, and the Midrash is not one little book. What is the Midrash? There's a lot of stories in the Bible that they feel that the, the, the rabbinic sages over time see things that look like contradictions or unexplainable that they kind of fill in gaps. So let me give you an example. Remember we talked about the story where Moses and Aaron go before Pharaoh? So here's what the rabbis do. They look at the scripture and it says, Moses and Aaron went before Pharaoh. And then Moses and Aaron go, I mean, I mean the rabbis look at this and they go, wait a minute. How is this going to work? Can you imagine right now, we have a problem with Biden. We just get in our car. We drive to Washington. We go up to the gate, and we just knock on the door. We need to talk to Biden right now. We have a problem with you, right? OK, you, I know a lot of you would love to do that, right? But, but OK, but this is something. The rabbi said, we know you can't just go before Pharaoh, who sees himself as a god. How, uh, here's how it worked. Pharaoh had a birthday. And on his birthday, Everybody in the kingdom had to give him gifts. And when Moses and Aaron brought their gift before Pharaoh, they're like, here you go, Pharaoh. By the way, we come in the name of the God of the Jews. And he said, let my people go. Right? That's how he got his, like, in. And so you have stories like that that, are, uh, uh, that, that fill in that space. Now, there's going to be the mystic tradition. You probably heard of Kabbalah or Kabbalah. Uh, Madonna was into it and Britney Spears. Okay, there's all that. Okay. But... Um, it, you, you, those are the mystical traditions of Judaism. There's a lot of different things that I'm not going to take time to cover. But if you remember Tanakh, the Hebrew uh, Aramaic scriptures, Talmud, and Midrash, you have the basic idea of where Judaism gets its ideas from. Is that, is that clear enough? Helpful? OK. OK, now, there was a group, and they still exist, of Jews. They're called the Karaite Jews, or Karaim. And all I'm going to mention about them is around the ninth century, you get a, a group of Jews who looked at all the rabbis talking. I think like the story of that, the, the uh, oven of Achnai story, you know, where the rabbis are debating with God. They're not comfortable with that, okay? And they basically say, we believe in the Tanakh, the equivalent to the, you know, the Christian uh, uh, Old Testament. This rabbi uh, oral Torah and uh, all these other stories, we don't. We don't agree, and they reject those. And so they're going to be a very small portion. Some, some still exist. And this is going to sound a little bit like Protestant Christianity, isn't it? A little bit. But we'll talk more about that in a second. Uh, OK? So I just thought I would uh, bring that up. Now, so let's go into Christianity. All right? OK. Um, it's going to start in the same area that we were starting with Judaism, right? Am I right? Just wanted to remind us of the ge geography of where we're at. OK? Now. For this is this, and this is very important, because we talked about how sometimes Jews are misunderstood because we focus on the Tanakh, and people don't know about the Talmud. When you say you're a Christian, you're talking about Jesus, right? And Jesus is the center. The Gospels, which are the stories we'll talk more about, the the the, the stories about Jesus and the sayings. That yes, that's important, but Jesus said very little about sex. The do's and don'ts, what's right or wrong, barely, barely talked at all. Doesn't talk about gender issues, OK? Um, not really. Um, doesn't really give you an idea of I was going to believe that Jesus is the Messiah. What would the religion look like? How should I act if I'm going to believe that Jesus is the Messiah? It's not super clear in the stories about Jesus. Christianity, the church, really comes from the texts in the, in the Christian New Testament that revolve around Paul's writings, OK? He's known as Saul and Paul. There's no, it's uh, uh, just, just to say he starts off being called Saul and then later is called Paul. It appears that one, he's a Jewish Roman, and, he, and, he, and one's his Jewish name and one's his Roman name. That's, let's just leave it at that for now, OK? But we're going to call him Paul. And he's uh, attributed to writing several books, even more. Traditionally, even more than the ones I have on the top here, Galatians, Romans, 1st and 2nd Corinthians, Philemon, uh, and so forth. Now, um, and basically what's going to happen is that he persecutes Christians. He is 
a, a Jewish guy that does not like Christianity. He even has them killed. And he gets a voice in heaven telling him, you know, why are you persecuting me? And he gets blinded. It's Jesus, okay? Jesus that's already died and is now in heaven, and he's talking to him, and he's critiquing, uh, he, he's saying, telling to Paul, you're, you're on the wrong side of history. And Paul, blinded now, hearing this voice, is like, yeah, I probably am. Right, right, like, it, it's, a, it's a convincing uh, argument <laughs> for him. And so he says, okay, I guess I'm a Christian now. <laughs> and so he switches, and he switches gear very uh, intensely, um, his writings even come before the Gospels uh, 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 when you study the timeline, okay? And his, 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 his message is going to be very simple. The Torah was nailed to the cross with Jesus. He is going to say that uh, we are all riddled with sin, and he's the one that's going to talk about the second uh, uh, Adam being Jesus. Paul's message is this. You're going to be saved by your faith, not by works. And you need to recognize the blood of Jesus Christ and that he's your Lord and Savior. Real simple. And that's going to be, and he's going to say, the circumcision, you know, to be a, a Jewish male, you have to clip your, you know, you know, you have to clip off something, right? Okay. Okay. You don't have to do that anymore. That makes it a lot easier to bring a lot more people in, right? <laughs> okay. Okay. So he ends the uh, uh, male circumcision. He says, we're now, it's symbolic. We're circumcised of the heart. Okay. So, um, and he's going to, uh, um, on this map here, I just want to show you, even though Jesus is coming from the idea of, you know, over here, Paul is going to be an apostle to the nations. He's going to be bringing the message on here. here here's Syria, and here's Antioch. Christianity is, in the, the own New, uh, New Testament scriptures, is going to put Christianity first being mentioned as a title here, even though it's starting over here, Okay. Uh, y yes, and they're Greek speakers. And actually, oops, actually I want to say something else. So let me actually talk about Paul uh, uh, a little bit more detail. He creates the church. He talks about sexuality quite a bit. Okay, I, if you're going to get involved in the culture wars, and I'm not going to tell you where I stand on all this, but we know it's out there, y'all, right? Okay, we all understand that there's a culture war in America, okay? The culture war, if you're going to talk about gay marriage, if you're going to talk about feminism, if you're going to talk about all these things, Paul has a lot to say. Some of you might like what he says, some of you may not like what he says. I'm not going to tell you if it's right or wrong, but right, we know he says a lot about these things, okay? He says, you're not going to be, uh, 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 get everlasting life if you're doing blah, 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 blah. He's got a whole list of, he's also got drunkenness in there too <laughs> on St. Patrick's Day. Here we are. Okay, all right, so, uh, um, but he's got, he's got lists, and he, he even tells you, if you want to, uh, how the church should be set up, you know, the role of those who are in the church. So if you're Roman Catholic or Greek Orthodox or any of the, uh, okay, the structure of the church is rooted in the teachings of Paul. If you are an evangelical Christian and you're into that Bible-only Christianity, you know, it's not a religion, it's a relationship. You feel me on this, right? Okay. But you go to a church and you have a pastor at the church, it's still Pauline. Right? It's still something that's set up within the text of Paul. I don't think that's controversial to say. I think most Christians would agree with that if, you, you know, if you're looking at this. Okay? So that's just something to point out. All right. Now, let's talk about the Gospels. The Gospels are, of course, the actual stories about Jesus Christ and his message and what he does. We see these dates. These are rough dates, circa 80 to 100, uh, around C circa means around, could be, okay, uh, some of these dates. Some more conservative Christians kind of put different dates on those. Uh, 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 that's fair. I, I'm not going to debate. This is just a consensus view of scholarship on, on the dates. And the three, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, are called synoptic gospels because they have very similar uh, uh, stories. But the similarity means they're also different. Now, if you're an outsider... You're not a believer. You just wanted to read these on your own. And if you're going to be honest, they contradict each other. There are stories that are mainly the same, but they're not the same. Now, I would argue that Christians do. We don't have a, a midrash tradition in Christianity. 
But remember how the Midrash kind of tries to bring in stories to make the story seem more believable or make sense? I, I think that Christianity has w what I would call an informal, an informal or unofficial type of Midrash. In other words, when you, I, I know this because I've grown up. You know, when you hear a story and you have a minister or a pastor talk about the three Gospels, they will tell you stories that will help make sense of the three and make them not seem like they contradict each other. Now, I'm not going to make a critique of this. We're not going to settle this all here. Some of you are going to say that these are very convincing stories. Some would say that they're not. Uh, my point is, is that that's how Christianity has dealt with that historically. Right? Does that make sense to everybody? Okay. There, there, I mean, there are, there are, I've heard some stories too that I thought are pretty convincing. So I'm not even just putting this down or making a jab, but that, but, but there are, they are contradicting stories and they do require some explanation to figure out, work through. Okay. And then you have John is the last book and John starts off with, in the beginning was the word, the word was with God and the word was God. Okay. Now this is where we get that divinity of Jesus very straight. Right, right off the get-go, right? Okay. Now, here's what's going to surprise you. Around 160 to 175, there was a Christian. His name was Tatian. And he saw these four Gospels. And I think he just thought, you know, the, the stories that are contradicting each other, uh, all this, he fused the Gospel into one. The diatessaron, it's a Greek word that means through the four. And he created one gospel, and he even made it start in the place that would make sense. You know, so it's John. The last book starts with in the beginning. He thinks that's a good place to start the book, the gospels, in the beginning, right? Okay? So he is going to make this the gospel. Now, here's what's interesting. The Syrian Christians, the Christians living in the area where the very term Christian is first used, they're going to embrace the diatessaron as their gospel from around this time period up into the 5th century. For several hundred years, the Christian community in Syria only understood the gospel of Jesus Christ through a text that probably most of you here have not heard of. Right? I think that's interesting. Now, Tatian ended up being viewed as a heretic of sorts, and he got discredited, and so eventually the Syrian church switched to the four Gospels. But this was no minor event. Why I have this Arabic uh, posted up here, this looks like the Quran. Remember, the Quran's written in Arabic, and you see the, the, the writing there? This is a 10th century manuscript. A Christian Arab felt the need to translate the Syriac Gospel of the Diatessaron into Arabic. Here it starts, Bismillah in the name of God, El Wahid, the One, El Ab, the Father, Wa ibn the son, al ruh al qaddas and the Holy Ghost. Christian. It's Christian. Okay? So, um, and, and so that's just something I thought was important to mention. And why I'm also mentioning this is that pinpointing when all of the Christians had one Bible that they all agreed upon, or, or do they ever have one Bible, this is where it gets a little bit tricky. Okay? Now, on top of that, remember how I said that the Protestant Christians have the same books as the Jews for, for the Tanakh, but the Catholics don't. Well, here's what happened. Let's fast forward to uh, uh, the 16th century. Anybody heard of Martin Luther? Okay. German theologian. He was Catholic at first, and he starts questioning teachings by the official church. And he also looks at the Bible, and he says, and he doesn't say it this way, I think Christians have had the wrong Bible for over 1,500 years. Okay? And he looks at the Old Testament, and he says the Jews, even though he doesn't think the Jews did a lot of things, they, didn't, they don't acknowledge the Messiah, he's got a lot of problems with the Jews, but he feels, for whatever reason, that they got the, the, the Old Testament right. And so these books are parts of the Old Testament that are in a Catholic Bible that the Protestants don't have. Tobit, uh, uh, Baruch, um, First and Second Maccabees. And some of these, if you have the book of Daniel, there's a story of uh, uh, the three little holy children, or I, I, don't, I think I erased it, but Bell and, oh, Bell and the dragon. 
There's a whole set of stories added in the book of Daniel that's in the Catholic Bible that's not in the Protestant. But again, keep in mind, Christians had all of this, at least with the Roman Catholic tradition, for over 1,500 years. And Martin Luther says, I don't think it should be there. This, these were even in the original King James Bible. But Christians just stopped be believing in the Protestant Christians. And, the, and they just the only reason why they're not in Protestant Bibles is they just stopped printing them. So originally, when, he's, when they stopped believing in them, they just put them off to the side. And then eventually, they just stopped putting them in at all. Here's also what's interesting. Ethiopia converted to Christianity, at least a good section of it, around the same time of Constantine. Christ Ethiopian Christians have been Christians for that long. They have the largest Bible canon, 81 books, and it's an open canon. Uh, hypothetically, they can get rid of a book or add a book any time that their special arrangements to do that could happen. So what am I saying? Christians don't have the same Bible universally. In America, it feels like Christianity does because most Christians have like a King James New International Version, the New American Catholic uh, Bible, all right? And they're mainly the same, but I'm simply saying on a global level, and also like the book of Revelation, it's in the Greek Orthodox text, but uh, many of the Orthodox churches actually don't believe Revelation should even be read from church on the pulpit. There's just a different way of looking at scripture in the Christian tradition. There's one other added thing I need to mention now. Uh, uh, about Christianity and how they come to beliefs of things. And I hope you guys are following this okay, because there's a lot of stuff I'm covering. So, are you guys following me okay? Okay. We're almost uh, to the Q&A section. Right? Uh, okay. Okay. And I'm still going to get to Islam, believe it or not, on time. Okay. So, for, for, for Protestant Christians, which the, America was founded mainly by Protestant Christianity, and Catholicism was kind of had a rough start. Keep in mind, when Kennedy first got elected, he was the, like the first Catholic. This was a big deal. Okay, now we don't think of it as a big deal, but at the time, it's like a big deal. And there's a, a, a lot of issues with Catholicism. We actually had Christmas banned in uh, uh, one of the colonies, uh, uh, or in some of the colonies, by pur Puritans who thought it was too Catholic y. Uh, 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 okay, Cath being Catholic was not a good thing. That's why Irish Catholics had a problem, you know, in immigration early on. It's, there, there were papists, papists, you know, following the pope, okay? Now, so, but, but I think that Protestant Christianity, if you grow up in Protestant Christianity, you're missing the point of how much of historic Christianity developed. So I'm not saying you're, you're wrong. I'm not, gonna, I'm, not, I'm not settling anything on who's right or wrong right now, okay, right? But I'm just pointing out the difference. In the, the church, remember, the church now is attached to Rome, I'm starting here. Remember how like the rabbis had the, the oven of Achanai and the majority wins and if you're on, and you're debating and you lose, you're out. Basically, all of the Christian organizations that believe in the church as an institution, so Catholic, Eastern Orthodox, all of the big kind of Orthodox, all the ones that have priests or Armenians, uh, if you guys see all big robes, you know, garments, all that kind of stuff, okay? They believe that their church is inspired of God, the institution. So church councils are going to make conclusions about what is God's word. A Protestant Christian or evangelical, you just get together and you pray. You look at the word of God, you pray, and you say God's word says. That's, that's how it comes down to you. But if you're Catholic, if you're of, an, of, of orthodoxy, these councils also define. So this was a council, Constantine and, and attaching Christianity to, to start getting attached to Rome. One of the first councils, the Council of Nicaea, was a debate about the nature of Jesus, the Arian heresy. There was a man who was claiming that Jesus was only God's son, right? Sound familiar, like that debate I was telling you about going on to this day with some uh, Christians? And the council said, the majority of us say Jesus is God, the, anybody who per, says different gets kicked out. They lost, okay? And they're out. And this is going to be how Christianity gets formed. And it's not going to be seen as a contradiction to the Bible. It is a compliment. Just like the Talmud for a, for a religious Jewish person, the Talmud is not, a con, it's not man over the, the, the word of God. It's a compliment. It's still God-inspired. 
That's how a rabbinic Jewish person would see it. If you're Catholic, the church council, the institution itself, it's not a contradiction. If the church teaches something that you can't find in the Bible, that doesn't matter because the because the, 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 the church is inspired of God. That's what you need to know. So if you don't believe in that church and that teaching isn't in the Bible, then it doesn't make sense to you. Do you guys all understand what I'm saying? Okay. So I, I think it's good to understand the difference between the way certain Christians, of, where they differ, those who are at the Bible only. So again, remember the Karaite Jews? There's a lot of Christians that are like them. We're going to just read the Bible. But historic Christianity has been attached to institutions and the churches have had just as much say in what that uh, means. Now, I'm actually almost done with this part. I'm going into uh, Islam. I'll only run over my time very, very little because Islam is much easier to explain, believe it or not, okay, when I go over this. Okay. I went to an Assyrian church of the East, and this book was recommended to me by a deacon, which is very strange because it's the most violent book about Christianity I've ever read. But he, like, gave it to me, and he thought that this was very helpful. Um, it's called Jesus Wars. This is, I believe, a Christian the, uh, a believer himself, but it's called How Four Patriarchs, Three Queens, and Two Emperors Decided What Christians Would Believe for the Next 1,500 Years. And what the book documents is that uh, in, in the 5th century, around half of all Christians belonged to a Christian group deemed heretical by the church. What he, do, what, what he just shows is that early on, Christian councils, those councils, were just kicking out. They were having all these debates, like the rabbis debating Eleazar, except they, then when they would kick out a, a, a priest or somebody, he had followers. And so then that would just be a new branch of Christianity. So you guys following me, right? And so this became this kind of almost chronic problem that the church had. And even this writer poses that, you know, remember, Muhammad's going to get a revelation around 610. This is uh, in the 5th century late, but in the, relative to all of this, Christians have been going through killing each other over fighting mainly over the exact nature of Jesus. And there's going to be a new religion that's going to come around that says, it's really simple. God's just one. Jesus is just a prophet. It's not that complicated, right? Okay? So what he basically argues is that perhaps these Jesus wars really dehabilitate, really just kind of weakened the structure of Christianity um, and that's one possibly reasons why Islam is going to take off like wild, wildfire, even in the Christian world uh, later on. We're not going to resolve that here. I just wanted to, I thought it was a good transition into Islam, okay? Remember I talked about Muhammad coming from this area in the Hejaz? Here's Jerusalem, not too far from where Judaism and Christianity starts, right? Just thought I would remind us of that. Nowadays, this is Saudi Arabia, okay? And look, this is the Persian Empire. This is the Byzantine Christian Eastern Roman Empire, okay? And that's significant. Now, can I drink water here? Okay. Lachmedes and Ghassanids. Here's what's interesting. These are Arab Christian kingdoms, mini kingdoms, caught up in between the Persians and, and there. Most of you may not, most people think of Arabs as strictly being Muslims. To this day, a lot of Arabs are Christian, but the majority are Muslim. But at this time, when Muhammad is alive, a lot of Arabs are actually Christian. So Muhammad is going to become in context to a, an Arab world that is familiar with Christianity, is what I'm trying to say, and different branches of Christianity, okay? That's, that's important to note. Here, the Hemyar dynasty in Yemen. Believe it or not, in the uh, 5th century, Arab, there's an Arab kingdom that's going to convert to Judaism. Believe it or not. And actually, they even tried to force convert some Christians into Judaism, Arabs. Okay? This is a very little known history. I promise you it's there. It's not conspiracy theory. Okay? Okay? But, um, so my point is, is that Muhammad is going to be a part of a world that recognize that, that, that there, there's Christians here, there's going to be Arab uh, uh, Jews, there's also going to be Jews that probably aren't Arab, uh, weren't from Arab converts that are also a part, just, just, you know, from the outside coming in. So it's not like something he's not familiar with. There's also going to be the main 
group that he's going to be debating with and come out of. It's pagan Arab world, the pagan Arab world. This is what in Islam is called the al jahiliyyah the time of ignorance. The Arab world was mainly not Christian and Jewish, but it was, they worship, it's like, you know, like Greeks being into Zeus or the Germanic people into uh, Odin, okay? These are gods and goddesses that are mentioned in the Quran, and they wanted to eradicate them. So this is what, now this is a modern depiction, this art here, this may or may not be an accurate depiction, but these are Al-At, Al-Uzza, and uh, Manat. They are mentioned in the Quran as these three goddesses. And uh, in Judaism and Christianity, did they let paganism exist? No. Is Islam going to let paganism exist? No, okay? But there is, so keep in mind that in the Quran, okay, actually, so let's go back for a second. Keep in mind that in the Christian New Testament, it is a focus on Jesus, but it's a debate about Judaism in its relation to Christianity and the world, the outside world and its relation to Christianity. So there's two real main audiences that are being talked to in the Christian scriptures. In the Quran that Muhammad is going to say is a revelation of God, he's going to be having d debates. Remember, we already told you that the Quran says, say not Trinity. That's poking at the Christians, right? He's already going to say, hey, Jewish people, Jesus was the Messiah. It's already going to say that. He's mainly going to, the, the Quran is mainly going to really be saying that this is shirk. This is idolatry. This is bad. Okay, and so that's the main issue that's going to be uh, 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 in, the, in the Quran. Eventually, Muhammad, when he finally takes political power, all of that's going to be removed. This used to be, if you guys see on the, in the news, Mecca and in, in now Saudi, Saudi Arabia, Muslims ha, uh, do a pilgrimage around this uh, uh, here. This would have been filled with idols before. Muslims got rid of that. Okay, so this was an important place prior to Islam. Now, I'm mainly just going to focus on right now is what is the Quran and what are the other texts that Muslims use to define Islam itself. So you see, I skipped a lot of Islamic history. We're going straight to this, okay? Quran means recitation. For Muslims, this is the only miracle that Muhammad brings to the world. Jesus resurrects the dead, right? He walks on water. He even turns water into wine, <laughs> which is the, that's the first uh, miracle he actually does. Okay, in the Gospels. For Muslims, yes, Muhammad is God-inspired person, and he is a, a, a military genius. He's also good at, at, at building coalitions, but that—that's. But the miracle he brings is the Quran. This is the holy text of God. It's about the size of the Christian New Testament. It's not that big. Believe it or not, a lot of Muslims memorize the entire thing. They're called the Hafez, okay? There's even contests. Children do it. In Egypt, they'll just play a random verse of the Quran, and then the kid has to just start where it left off and, like, give a few verses. It's kind of mind-boggling, actually. But if you study the Arabic, it's set up much more easy to... It's, it's got a rhythm and kind of, like, poetic. You know, like in Arabic, they'll say, Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim in the name of God, the Beneficent, the Merciful. Alhamdulillah, Rabbil Alameen. Praise be to God, the Most Beneficent, the Merciful. Okay, and you, it has a rhythm, a droning effect. And for a Muslim, this is, remember, this is God's speech. And there was a debate they had in their, uh, I think the early Middle Ages, but at one time, but the consensus view won that this is the uncreated word of God. That God was never made. And if he had a vision or, I mean, or if he had signs, then it was with God the entire time, so it couldn't have been made either. So the Quran is God's uncreated speech. But here's uh, where it gets difficult for a reader. If you s listen to this speech tonight, or maybe in the past you did this, you pick up the Quran, you want to read it and see what Muslims believe, for whatever reason, you're going to find it difficult to follow along, to be honest. It starts off with Surat al-Fatiha. This is, this is the prayer that they pray five times a day. Not very long, like about the size of the Lord's Prayer. And as Christians, if you know the Lord's Prayer, and it said, doesn't say anything controversial that a Jewish person or a Christian would, ha would be uh, uh, bothered by. And, it's, and you, you praise God and you call, 
wait for the day of judgment and want to not sin and stay on the straight path, right? Okay? And then it's the largest book to the shortest, not in chronological order. Okay? And you have some of these uh, 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 early, there's the Meccan surahs, and then there's the Medinan surahs. There's, there's some early revelations and some later ones. A Muslim will tell you that the first revelation of the Prophet Muhammad starts in chapter 96, verse 1 through 4. How would you know that? You won't. So how do you know that? Hadiths. Okay, so I'll explain something about this in a second. A Muslim will tell you that if you read the Quran, you are getting the word of God. You, it's not going to be bad for you. But it is holy, so you should not be drinking alcohol while you read it. You should never drink alcohol, actually. But you especially wouldn't do that. It's holy, right? You would make sure you were clean. You, you try to clean your thoughts. It's, it's, it's intimate. And if you read it and, and you're going to believe in it, even if you don't understand it, you're still okay because it's the word of God, right? You're still in good company, okay? But, but if you want to understand it and the context... And this is the little known fact. So if you guys get this down, just like no, it's important to know the Talmud for uh, uh, the Jewish people and those Midrash stories. When people say that Islam is just the Quran, they're missing a very important aspect to how Jewish theology, Jewish, I mean, sorry, Islamic theology, Islamic law actually works. Sharia, we've heard that, Islamic law. They have a collection called Hadiths and I'll explain Sunni in just a second, but hadiths are traditions about the sayings of the Prophet Muhammad and his actions. So they believe that Muhammad was the perfect reflection of God's word. So early on, people would tell stories, and they literally, everything, okay, right? I mean, when you're a kid, right? If we raise a child, we're teaching them how to wash their hands, am I right? You tell the kid, oh, wait, your zipper's down. Zip that thing up. That's how a kid knows you better zip their zipper up, right? You don't naturally know that. I mean, you can function all day without a zipper being zipped up and be fine. But you know it's bad manners. Zip it up, right? So this, they literally have stories where somebody says, we saw the prophet go use the restroom, and he left everybody and went privately to go use the restroom. Oh, we need to have good manners. By the way, if you travel around the world, not everybody thinks that way. So, some people just will go to the restroom in public. Okay, That's not everybody, but there's, everybody has different standards. Okay, And so they're like, what is my moral behavior to follow? Uh, um, okay, And so these hadiths are that. Now you notice the, the revelation of Muhammad is in 610. Not long after he dies, the Quran is put to writing. I should have mentioned that. These are put to writing several hundred years later. And these are oral traditions about the Prophet Muhammad, what he said and what he did. So there became this mission of these characters. One man is named Bukhari, and the other one is named Muslim. So Muslim is being a religion, but it's also his name. Okay? They went on this, this, these missions, sometimes traveling very far, to try to get all these down. And they, they believe they have a science of, of whether or not these things are credible or not. I don't have time to go into that if you're curious. Ask me, and I'll explain it uh, uh, at the end. But they go around, and they make a collection of these uh, uh, sayings. And they're called Sahih Bukhari and Sahih Muslim. But a Sahih means authentic. And so what they do is they come up with a category of credibility within these uh, texts. And by the way, it won't be, I won't be much longer. I'm almost done, and we're going to cover all of this nicely, I think. Um, sahih means authentic. The lowest grade is da'if. Da'if means weak. It doesn't mean it's not possible, but in other words, it'd be kind of like this. When you're in court, if you were a judge, and somebody said, I murdered somebody, and you said, that person's guilty. That's sahih. It's a pretty solid. You're, 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 it's pretty clear that the evidence is strong that that person is guilty, right? But let's say you have some circumstantial evidence that seems credible, but it's not really as much as you would like, right? For, we know about this in court. They're going to, these hadiths are going to be in that kind of level. There's going to be some that are just, they, they're very confident is credible information and some are not. But what are these hadiths? They actually talk about when the Prophet Muhammad, and they'll always say peace be upon him, by the way. So a religious Muslim usually 
they don't just say Muhammad, they say Muhammad Salah Alayhi Wasallam, Muhammad peace. And it's same with actually the prophets of Christians. They will say, Jesus, peace be upon him. You'll just you'll notice that. But they'll say, these hadiths tell of when the prophet got what revelation. So you know how I said it starts with 96 verse 1 through 4? How do they know that? The hadiths bring in the, con, the, the context. And okay, here's another thing the hadiths and study of the Quran do and some of the methodologies of the Islamic scholars. When you're a Christian, we have the Old Testament, the books in the, in the, in the Bible, right? And then you have the Christian Testament. Okay, we say that the Old Testament's holy, but we believe that the blood of Jesus replaces the Torah. What is said in the Old Testament that is applicable to Christians now, and what was only time-specific back then? Do you guys feel me on this? Okay, Christianity's had a hard time dealing with that. Jesus says, turn the other cheek. In the Old Testament, God's all in the war. If you go into the military, the Christian chaplain reads you all the war scriptures, okay? If you're a hippie and you want, uh, you guys see where I'm going with this? Okay, okay. How do we deal with this? Islam has an entire study on verses that they believe are uh, specific to a very particular instance and others that are universally applicable to all times. And guess what? They don't all agree exactly on these precisely. So there's different schools of thought. And these are not really important for you to know, but I just wanted to point out, because we're just trying to understand the process in which Muslims come up with things. You had legal schools, especially when an, an Islamic uh, uh, country existed. So if you studied history, Ottoman Empire, you studied uh, uh, other nations, they would have had legal schools that they followed. The, Saudi Arabia basically follows Hanbali. He was the most conservative. He said, on making a decision, I would rather make a decision uh, with a hadith that's da'if, that's weak, than trust in my own intellect. I mean, he's that, he, he doesn't want his human folly to go. He'd rather work with a sort of credible hadith than, the, you know, if there's a gray area dis, dis, decision on something, right? Okay, so they all are going to have these different schools of thought on this. And they're going to try to pinpoint certain things. So by the way, okay, the elephant in the room is a lot of you, a lot of us, when you're exposed to Islam, we think 9-11, the war's going on, all this kind of stuff that we're trying to process. What about these groups that say death to America? What about your neighbor who's nice? What do I make with all of this? Okay, uh, I, I, I will just say this. Just like Christian theology, there are verses in the Quran that sound very hostile to, to, and then others sound very peaceful. And remember how I told you there's all these contexts, okay? Guess what? Same with Christianity. Guess what? Same with uh, uh, Judaism. The Talmud gets put out of context a lot. Sometimes white supremacists look to the Talmud and they look at verses where people who are not Jewish are looked upon very bad and they say, look at Jewish people say how bad the rest of us are. And there are some radical rabbis in Israel who actually says that non-Jews are snakes. But that's not all of them. You guys get what I'm saying? They're, they're, in other words, these texts, like anything else, you have some people who uh, look one way and some are another. Okay, we're almost done. Um, um, there's two groups of, 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 of Muslims, and really I'm not going to focus on this too much. Just know this, that there are these different collections of the traditions. Iran, for example, or Iran, they're a different branch of Islam. They have slightly different hadiths. What's important for you to really understand is that just like the Christian world, the Muslim world has different sets of authorities and maybe different takes on what it means to be a Muslim. So just like if you're a Jehovah's Witness, Catholic, a Mormon, Baptist, Evangelical, you'll all say you're Christian. You'll all say you believe in the Bible. Do you all believe the same thing? We can give you a presentation for five hours, right? Okay, to explain the differences on that. Islam has kind of the same. So just keep that in mind, okay? So much so that I'm running out of time to actually cover all of it. But I just thought a nice way to end this uh, presentation. In the uh, 13th century, there was a, uh, a Muslim, an Islamic man who was uh, a mystic. He's not a, a, I had Muslim friends that you know, they're kind of conservative and they're like, this isn't really what a Muslim is supposed to believe. Uh, but he is a Muslim, he was a, he's a Sufi, 
This is what he says. My heart is a poem he wrote. My heart has become capable of every form. It is a pasture of, for gazelles and a convent for Christian monks and a temple for idols and the pilgrims Kaaba and the tables of the Torah and the book of the Quran. I follow the religion of love. Whatever way love's camels take, that is my deen, my religion, and that is my iman, my faith. So my point is, every time you see a terrorist of any faith that's ranting, there's always one of these guys in the room, right? Two, right? OK? So that's where I'm going to end this right now, and I hope that that was easy to follow. So we have about 30 minutes scheduled for Q&A. We're going to go ahead and we're going to go through that Q&A. When we're done, we'll take a pause for anybody that wants to go. And then if anybody wants to stick around a little bit longer and really grill them on some of this stuff, you're welcome to do so. But are there any questions out there? Okay, that's a good uh, question. Oh, one more thing. Okay, okay. Why did the Romans have like similar gods to the Greeks, like before Christianity? Um. Okay, so let me see if I can. Um, that's a lot to unpack. So, but but it's a fair thing because what 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 he's asking this is fair in this this case this does have a context. Roman Catholicism is called Roman, isn't it? Yeah. Right. Okay. And uh, uh, all right. So. Um. Greeks came first and conquered the world and spread Greek culture, Alexander the Great. You can thank for that. Eventually, the Romans are going to come. The Romans are going to actually like a lot of the things the Greeks have to say. There's going to be a poet that a Roman said, captive Greece uh, holds Rome captive, because the Romans are going to be so uh, um, influenced by Greek culture. And sometimes we can call it Greco-Roman culture. The Greek Orthodox Church actually calls themselves Roman. The Eastern Roman Empire is going to be mainly using Greek, but it's going to be considered Roman. Um, uh, and they, their gods are going to be very similar. By the way, there are some differences with those religions. But bringing us up into Christianity, remember I talked about Constantine, OK? So in the fourth century, and right now, my brain is a little bit mushed. I'm not going to be able to tell you the exact date that I should. Paul probably has this in his head better. But it's going to be legalized under Constantine in the fourth century. And I think, was it three? Theodosius. Theodosius uh, starts wiping out the other religions around 390. 390. 390, the Roman world makes Christianity the only acceptable religion, with the exception of letting Jews be persecuted as a minority. <laughs> uh, 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 OK, um, in truth. OK, but that's it. Is that good? OK. The, with the, the Christians? I, well, th this idea that maybe uh, the uh, the Romans, when uh, they adopted Christianity, can't beat them, join them, would you say that that's kind of a, would that be a fair? I, I think it's fair to say, okay, so first of all, I should point something out, and I think everybody here will agree with this. If you're a, uh, if you're a believer in the faith communities of any of these things, and I'm actually going to answer this question, if you're a believer in any of these faiths, you simply trust that God's spirit directs you to the truth, and all the historical complications are not necessarily a big deal. That's why when you go to church, the mosque, or the synagogue, for the most part, you pray, you get association with your brothers and sisters, and you get spiritual nourishment. That's how you see it. Am I right? Okay, you, you get the ritual, and um, you don't worry about it so much. When it comes to the Romans, say, beat them or join them, it's kind of complicated to think about Rome's relationship with Christianity is a conundrum. It's, it's a big topic. It's such a big topic that I would need to get a person that's more of an expert on Rome, uh, uh, right? I think that we'll <laughs> probably try to do a hot talk on that. <laughs> okay. Yeah. I, I, do know, I do know that a lot of times when Christianity was spread throughout Europe and throughout other places, um, the, the three 
especially with, with Catholicism, the three uh, fathers of the Holy Ghost was used as a means of converting those who worshipped triple deities. So it was used often as a means to, to convert those that were not as easy to convert to say the Roman God. Okay, right. So, so this, 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 this is ultimately what's interesting, right? Look, whether it's political or religious, we, if you're wanting to convert somebody to something through persuasion, you don't, in other words, I mean, with a gun, I can make you say anything out loud, right? But I mean, if I actually wanted to persuade you, you're going to look into something that you hold in common, right? And so Christians would look to what is non-Christian ideas and try to convince those uh, people that their deities that are in threes or something like that, you know, that, that, that they're on to something. That, that what they're bringing to the table isn't so different, right? right? So you're going to find common ground. And it gets blurry. The difference between what's actual pagan and what's Christian, part of what Protestant Christianity is going to do later on um, is it's going to have uh, debates about is Christianity... Are, are, did, did we find something in common and, and bring them in, or did, we, did they infiltrate us and the Christianity take on pagan beliefs? And that's going to be a debate that Christians have for up until now, if that makes sense. So you mentioned earlier on a lecture when you were covering Judaism that when you were born into Judaism, there is 631. Th 13. Sure. So, um, the, uh, there's the covenant. If you look at the, 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 uh, the, the Bible, the Old Testament, the Torah, the first part, there's a lot of rules. It says things like, I think you can't mix cotton and linen. Okay? That's not something that are in the seven laws given to Noah that, that is expected of non-Jewish people. Um, in... It, it, you, you, it talks about the way you shave your beard or, or how you shave. There, there, uh, there, there's all sorts of different um, laws. And I did not memorize all 613, uh, uh, to my shame. Uh, um, but there's, uh, uh, so, and, and how this is determined if you have to follow this is you have to be born of a Jewish mother. That's in the Talmud, okay? And it, it's interesting. I, I, I wrote an email, you know, to ask a rabbi. You know, you can just do that. Like, hey, rabbi. Like, and I, you know, just talked about this. And the answer came back with no rule. Like, it's very simple. If your mother is Jewish, you're 100% Jewish. If your mother's not Jewish, you're 100% not Jewish. End of story. Okay? Now, um, this complicates things because um, many, okay, like my cousin is named Michael Grossman. But his mother was a Catholic, uh, raised Catholic. Like, his mother was my aunt from my blood side. And so his mother's not Jewish. His dad was going to be a rabbi at one time. He, Polish Jewish heritage. Rabbinically, he's not Jewish at all. But some, like, reform, like, some of the more, I guess, liberal, for lack of a better way of saying it, uh, uh, Jewish groups, like, do accept, you know, folks coming in you know, that, that claim to be Jewish, but they're not born of a Jewish mother. Israel has this controversy. There's some rabbis that think that even men who died in the Israeli army don't deserve a Jewish burial because they didn't properly trace their, their, their uh, mother uh, lineage proper enough. I had a Jewish friend that had problems with their, in their family because, uh, about trying to get uh, his sister buried uh, um, over this issue. Um, and so... Um, it's a thing. It's it, you know you know this this debate about you know what makes you Jewish or not. Obviously, an anti-Semite doesn't look at it that way, right? Somebody who doesn't like Jewish people is going to say, "Well, you look Jewish. You have a Jewish name. That counts." But I'll just tell you one quick story. When I was in college, I went to the school with this guy. He was a religious. Uh, he was a Hasidic Jewish guy, and um, he was going to the temple, and he had a friend that was studying to be a rabbi. He was actually a Middle East, he was uh, an Iraqi Jewish uh, descent uh, guy. And when they were, the rabbis have to double check on your background to make sure your, your mom's in the, all the moms are in the right spot. 
and there was a glitch. One of the moms wasn't. It, it derailed the whole thing. And then the rabbi tells him, look, we're going to count you in. We're just going to, like, like, it seems like you qualify. You've been into yeshiva. You've been studying all this stuff. And it's like the majority of your family. Were, and then he said, wait a minute. Are you telling me I don't have to follow all these 613 laws? That this is what he said, right? And he goes, I'm not joining. So in his mind, like, so he said, if I don't have to follow six, I only have to follow seven now? Cool. And, and he said, I'm not going to be. So, so that, that's just a, a little story into that context. Yeah. So you said earlier that the majority of Jewish faith. Um, in the early 2000s, we came across uh, the group Jews for Jesus. Mm -hmm. And I'm, I'm just curious how that, like, merging it happens and like like you talked about the division i'm just curious about that merging that's a great that's a great one so there's actually a response that some rabbis made called jews for judaism as a as a as a, as a, as a like you can look online uh, uh, to tackle this problem <laughs> okay and so um, you do have so if anybody doesn't know jews for jesus uh, are are christians some are from a Jewish background. Some Christians simply join it. It's kind of, a, it's like they refer to Jesus as Yeshua. I mean, it, it, they, they Hebrewize, like they use the Hebrew language. They really wrap themselves up in as much Jewish language and ritual as possible, but are claiming that they say Yeshua Mashiach, that Jesus is the Messiah, and they still believe in the Trinity. They believe in all of the they're, they basically align with the evangelical Christian world uh, very much. And um, they are very pro-Israel. But Orthodox Jews can't, well, I, they, have, they have big issues, right? OK, OK, so, so that's, that's where that stands. If that, if, Yeah, they're, 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 they're getting, they're trying to get Jewish people, they're making, we, that's what we talked about earlier about the pagans, you know, when the Christians going to the, the, the three gods, the triune gods and bringing them, it's finding, it's Christians trying to find as much, how can we be as Jewish as possible and get the Jewish uh, population to recognize that Jesus is the Messiah and make them realize that they don't have to go, give up their Jewishness. Here we go. Here's where they go a little different. They're saying, Jesus is the complement to your Jewishness. This is the only thing you have missing. Everything else you're doing is fine. And I, I, I should say this. I didn't bring this up, and this is where it gets complicated. Remember, Jews have this covenant with God. Traditional Christianity believes that when they rejected Jesus, that Jew, the Jews are no longer God's chosen people. Christianity has gone through weird debates with this. And evangelical Christianity in particular has kind of took on this idea that they're still God's chosen people that need to just simply accept Jesus. And there's a really wrapped up around Israel and end times. And I'm just going to say, I'm not going to get involved with this. If you guys ever want to have me come back and talk about the Israel-Palestine conflict, I'm glad to do it. That's not controversial at all. Uh, um, but uh, I do think that there, my personal belief is that there's been a danger of taking religion and not studying the politics of real life people and what they go through and simply saying, I'm going to support a state and give weapons based on bringing the end times. I mean, I have a lot of Palestinian Christian friends. I have a lot of Jewish friends too, okay? I'm not invested in anybody getting driven into the sea, okay? But my point is, is that the way th there is some sort of movement by some groups to really kind of ratchet up a more militarized approach to the conflict based on an end time concept that kind of Jews for Jesus kind of fall into that a little bit. But that's the most I'm going to tell you about my own opinion. But that, but that is what there, was going on, if that makes sense. And, and I would also add on to that, and I, I feel like we really need to do a TED Talk on this next year. Um, the followers of Jesus, of course, originally were all Jews, right? They, they, uh, they had Jewish traditions, and we actually have this in the book of Acts. Paul is, is arguing against it, and we know we have people who called themselves Nazarenes that existed at least up till the 300s who were explicitly Jewish, believing that the Messiah had come. Um, I think we have time for one more question. Like the heads of these religions, 
you've got like the rabbi or the priest or the pastor. With the different religions, is there a different role that those heads of those play? Major. Another hour later. Okay, but let's see, so, so what's the simplest way to say it? And actually, okay, so if you are Catholic, that's the easy one to start with. There's the Pope, right? <laughs> okay, we can start with that guy. <laughs> okay, he is the top of the, the church, right? That's important. And then you have a hierarchy. You have bishops, you know, deacons. You have like a whole structure. And if you're a believer and you want to know what to do, uh, you're a part of the church. Most people of any religion, by the way, doesn't, do not study all this. I have students all the time when I teach online that thank me for teaching. They learned something about their religion they didn't know because they just... It's, it's just, they just didn't study it, right? You know, they're born into it. They're, they're a part of it. But if you care, you talk to your priest, and you ask him, and he'll tell you, like, is it, can I get a divorce? And he says, according to the Catholic Church, no. Okay? It's going to go like that, right? Okay? Um, rabbis, if you're, you're, if you're a religious Jewish person, meaning that you have went full on into it and you're actually a part of a synagogue, you're going to ask the, the rabbi, like, is this acceptable or not? Some branches, I, I had a midrash workshop. That was so fun. With a female rabbi. Female rabbi from the conservative. They're called conservative. It's a little bit of a misnomer because they would be seen as very liberal. But uh, she's a female rabbi. I mean, in Orthodox Judaism, women are not even supposed to study this stuff, let alone be a rabbi. Okay, it's very different. So it's, there are these different groups. In Islam, there's no equivalent to a pope. Here's the important part I know about Islam. Sometimes on TV, there'll be like an extremist, and he makes a fatwa that all Christians must die. Let's just say something crazy like that, right? Or, 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 or death to all Americans. And nobody knows, if you don't know, does my Muslim friend next door all of a sudden like eating chips and watches this? And he's like, oh man, I used to like these guys next door. They got to go. No, it doesn't work that way. Any more than if, if like, you know, I have a lot... Well, let's take a look at Ireland. You know, Ireland is having a violent conflict between Protestants and Catholic Christians. Um, a lot of Americans marry Catholic to Protestant and certainly don't pay attention or know what to make of all that. I guess my whole point is, is that uh, it's not so easy to always follow who represents what, but th these worlds are divided quite heavily. And there's a lot of ideological conflicts. So, for example, Saudi Arabia and Iran hate each other. And they both see each other as a kind of heretical view of Islam, right? Okay. Um, keep in mind that Yitzhak Rabin, the, the only Israeli prime minister that was assassinated, was assassinated by a fellow Jewish man for breaking the Torah, not following it t according to the way this guy thought he should because he wanted to negotiate some land. Um, I don't know if this is answering everything, but it's, it's not, there's not like one main source only that's easy to go to. Unless now, if you're Jehovah's Witness or Mormon, they have an organization that's directly going to be the authority that they are going to follow, and it's going to be a little easier to pin down. If that answered your question. Okay. Thank you so much, everybody, for coming out. Uh, I want to remind you once again, the second Tuesday of next, or sorry, the, the second Thursday of next month, Pam, Pam Selfeld is going to be giving us a talk on Shakespeare. So if anybody here has any interest in Shakespeare, I, I encourage you to, to come out for that as well. And we've gotten such good questions here. I'm already planning out what next season's Hawk Talks are going to be like. And we're going to be doing something like this again, because I think this is really interesting stuff. I'd like to thank Professor Pollock one more time. And I'd love to thank all of you for coming out. It's been wonderful to have you out here. Uh, he's going to be up here in front. If anybody wants to still come ask him informal questions, you're certainly uh, free to do so.